Okay, and talking about cellular metabolism, we're gonna first talk about the biomolecules. Okay, so we're gonna cover both chapter two and chapter three. <coughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about biomolecules. We're first going to talk about basics of forming biomolecules. Then we're going to talk about the major biomolecules in humans, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleotides. Then we'll talk about cellular respiration and energy metabolism. And you'll notice that the book is going to go into way more detail than I'm going to go into detail in lectures about cellular respiration. Okay, and I'm going to hold you to the level of detail that I go into in lecture. Okay, so you don't need to memorize all the intermediaries, etc. Okay, the textbook goes into way more detail. But if you're taking the MCAT or the DAT or something, you might want to know that detail. Right? Okay, so let's talk about biomolecules first. And biomolecules and macromolecules are synonyms. And I'm going to start slipping and calling them macromolecules any second now, right? Because I learned them as macromolecules. But your textbook calls them biomolecules, but they're the same thing. I'm going to talk about forming them, and then we'll talk about carbs, lipids, proteins. Okay, so organisms, including humans, are made up of the four major macromolecules. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleotides. Okay, they constitute the building materials and machinery of the cell. Okay, hey. biomolecules are organic molecules. How many of you have had the pleasure of taking organic chemistry already? A good chunk of you, right? For those of you who haven't yet, you'll greatly enjoy it. It was my least favorite class, but I use chemistry all the time. Biochemistry was my absolute favorite chemistry class and organic was my least. Okay, so you can get through it. Organic molecules are carbon-based. Okay, so remember when we were talking about atoms and about how carbon wants four more electrons in its outer shell to be happy, right? Because carbon wants four more electrons, it likes to share, and because it likes to share, it forms bonds with other molecules, right? So that's why carbon is the building block of the biomolecules, because it wants to share electrons with other atoms. Hey, biomolecules have what are called functional groups that give them characteristic properties. And so I have this table from a different textbook that goes over the major types of functional groups that we see in the biomolecules. Okay, so hydroxyl groups are where oxygen is sharing an electron with hydrogen. Okay, oxygen is a much bigger atom than hydrogen, so it hogs the electron that it shares. Okay, and that gives oxygen a net negative charge and hydrogen a net positive charge. So hydroxyl groups are polar. Okay, hydroxyl groups are polar. Polar substances interact with water and therefore dissolve in water. Okay, and carbohydrates have loads of hydroxyl groups. So carbohydrates are hydrophilic or water soluble, however you want to say it. Carbohydrates are polar molecules because of the hydroxyl groups and therefore dissolve in water. Okay, carbonyl groups are found on lipids, and carbonyl groups are where carbon is sharing two electrons with oxygen. So this is a double bond, whenever you have two electrons being shared. Carbon and oxygen are pretty similar in size. They do a really good job of sharing equally. So these are nonpolar groups. So carbonyl groups are nonpolar, found on lipids. Okay, lipids are nonpolar, they're hydrophobic or lipophilic. Right? They don't like water. When you mix oil and vinegar together, what happens? Separates. Okay, carboxyl groups is where you have carbon sharing two electrons with oxygen. So it's got a double bond with oxygen. And then one electron with another oxygen. And that oxygen is sharing an electron with hydrogen. Okay, so here we have carbon 
and then two oxygens, this oxygen sharing with a hydrogen. These carboxyl groups are found on proteins. And what happens with the carboxyl groups, right? You can also write them out as just COOH. What happens at neutral pHs is that that carboxyl group actually gives off a hydrogen ion, okay? This oxygen actually completely takes that electron from hydrogen, and then hydrogen becomes positively charged, or a proton, okay? And this means that proteins are negatively charged. Anything that's charged is hydrophilic. Okay, so those carboxyl groups make proteins negatively charged. Okay, proteins also have amino groups. So unlike lipids and carbohydrates, proteins contain nitrogen, and the nitrogen is in the amino group. So here we have a nitrogen that's sharing single bonds with two hydrogens. Okay, and so amino acids have amino groups. And in order to use amino acids or proteins for energy, right, we actually have to take the amino group off. Okay, so we don't use the amino group for energy production. We excrete it as a waste product. And what is that waste product? We convert that amino group into who knows what molecule. And then we pee it out. What? Urea. Yep. So we convert amino groups into urea and then excrete those via the kidneys. Okay, the last functional group we're going to talk about is phosphate group. So here we have a phosphorus, okay, and is sharing electrons with oxygen. And these two oxygens have extra electrons, so they're charged. Probably stole them from hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen's really wimpy. Gives off its electrons to oxygen all the time. And then a double bond to oxygen. We find these phosphate groups on nucleotides, like DNA and RNA and on ATP, so adenosine triphosphate. So ATP has three of these phosphate groups, okay? ADP, adenosine diphosphate, has two. AMP, adenosine monophosphate, has one. And in this class, we spend way more time talking about ATP than about DNA and RNA. Okay. Any questions about those functional groups? Yeah? Would you recommend studying these functional groups in detail for the test? I would recommend knowing the names of the functional groups. You're not going to have to draw their structures, but it's a good idea to know what their structures are, whether they're polar or nonpolar, and where they're found. Okay, so if I ask you, you know, what is the structural group on carbohydrates that make them polar, and then I give you the option of hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, or amino, you would know which one to choose, right? So you don't have to be able to draw their structure or recognize them from their structures. But you kind of need to know their structures in order to know their function, right? So I'm saying yes and no. Hey, so we both make and break down macromolecules. Okay, when we make biomolecules, it's an anabolic process. Okay, so anabolic processes are making covalent bonds. Okay, when we make macromolecules, that anabolic process is termed dehydration synthesis, which your book calls condensation reactions, but I really like the term dehydration synthesis a lot more because I think it's way more descriptive. Okay, so here we have a disaccharide, say sucrose, which is what table sugar is, so that white sugar that you put on your Fruit Loops. Does anyone sugar their Fruit Loops anymore? It was really big in the 80s to like put sugar on your sugar cereals. Yep. Okay, so sucrose. And then let's say we have another glucose molecule here. And we're trying to make some glycogen. Okay, so dehydration synthesis is the removal of water and the formation of a covalent bond. Forming covalent bonds takes energy. Okay, so energy is put in. 
So when we make biomolecules, we're investing energy. We're putting energy into those molecules, and it's being stored in the form of covalent bonds. In order to make that covalent bond, we remove water. So that's where the dehydration comes from. Okay, breaking down biomolecules is a catabolic process, and it's called hydrolysis because we use water to break the covalent bonds. And when you break covalent bonds, you get a release of energy. Okay, so making covalent bonds requires energy. Breaking covalent bonds releases energy. Making covalent bonds causes the removal of water. So that's why it's dehydration synthesis. You're synthesizing some a covalent bond and you're removing water in the process. Okay, and then hydrolysis is breaking covalent bonds by inserting water in. Okay, both types of processes require enzymes. Okay, so we have enzymes to decrease the energy of activation so that we can do both dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis at physically, physiologically relevant temperatures. So otherwise you just have to pour on a whole bunch of heat in order to get these reactions to occur. Okay, let's start talking about those biomolecules. And we're gonna start with carbohydrates. Okay, how many of you love your carbohydrates? Okay, big sugar and bread eaters. <clears throat> okay, carbohydrates are also referred to as sugars, and they provide building materials and some energy storage. However, we really like to burn carbohydrates. And when we burn carbohydrates, we're breaking the covalent bonds between the carbon molecules. What? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> We're breaking the carbon bonds, or the covalent bonds between the carbon molecules, okay? And that energy that gets released, we use to make ATP, okay? In the process of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport, which we'll talk about on Friday, okay? Carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a one to two to one ratio. So for every carbon molecule, there's two hydrogens, and one oxygen. So who knows the formula for glucose? C6, H12, O6, exactly. We're gonna talk about three main types of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Okay, monosaccharides are also known as simple sugars. And they're classified as either pentoses or hexoses. Pentoses have five carbons, Okay, hexoses have six carbons. We have glucose and fructose being shown, which are both hexoses. Okay, and because they're both hexoses, they have the same molecular formula, C6H12O6. However, they have different structures. Okay, so here's fructose, here's glucose and its ring conformation. Notice they have different structures, and here's the straight chain for glucose and for fructose. So our body can tell the difference. So we regulate blood glucose levels, not blood fructose levels. We can convert fructose into glucose, right? But the problem with evil high fructose corn syrup, right, it's evil, is that it's way higher in fructose than sucrose, which is table sugar. Right? So high fructose corn syrup is way sweeter. It tastes sweeter to us because it has a whole bunch of fructose, and fructose tastes sweeter to us than glucose. Right? So it's sweeter, it's more delicious. However, it doesn't give us the same feeling of satiety. Okay, so they find that people who drink a soda before a meal don't eat any less during the meal, right? Because most of that sugar is coming in in the form of fructose, and fructose doesn't tell the brain the same thing that glucose does. Right? So that's why fructose and high fructose corn syrup in particular oftentimes leads to obesity and type 2 diabetes. Right, Because our body sees it very differently. You can convert between the two, 
Okay, so if you take in too much glucose, you can make it into fructose. Take too much fructose, make it into glucose. Okay, disaccharides are two monosaccharides covalently bonded. And we eat way more disaccharides than we do monosaccharides. Okay? We eat a lot of sucrose, a lot of maltose, and if you're not lactose intolerant, perhaps a lot of lactose. Okay, so sucrose is that white sugar that comes in bags that you can buy for really cheap prices. Okay, and it is a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. So here's a glucose, here's a fructose, here's sucrose. Covalent bond between the two. Okay, so the making of sucrose is an example of dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis. Dehydration synthesis. Okay, so energy would be on this side. Okay, so plants make sucrose for us. And then we break down sucrose in our small intestines by hydrolysis. And then we absorb the glucose and the fructose. Okay, maltose is the sugar that's made during fermentation. Okay, so it's not just the sugar in beer. Any fermented product is going to be high in maltose. Okay, and it's just two glucose molecules held together. And then lactose is milk sugar, and it's glucose plus galactose. And my guess is some of you in this room do not produce the enzyme lactase anymore. Okay, all humans produce lactase till about the age of five. Right, because milk is your main form of nutrition, especially as an infant. Okay, and then most humans stop producing the enzyme lactase, right? Except people of Northern European descent. So people of Northern European descent, way back thousands of years ago, right? Someone evolved the ability to produce lactase into adulthood. Right? And then they could eat milk and cheese from domesticated animals, and they grew better, right? And they had more offspring, and all those offspring produced the lactase into adulthood, and they grew better and produced more offspring, right? And so lactose tolerance spread throughout Europe, and then a lot of Americans are, are of European descent as well, okay? But non-European descent, most people are lactose intolerant, meaning they don't produce lactase. They don't break down glucose and galactose into the monomers. They don't absorb it in the small intestine. It goes to their large intestine, and the bacteria go crazy, right? And that's where you get all the symptoms of lactose intolerance. Stomach ache, gas production, diarrhea, etc. Hey, last type of carbohydrate we're going to talk about are polysaccharides. These are the complex carbohydrates, the ones you're supposed to eat. Okay, so you're supposed to eat a diet high in complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are many monosaccharides covalently bonded, and usually it's long chains of glucose. So here we've got starch. Each one of these gray molecules is a glucose. Okay, starch are glucoses sharing an alpha-1-4 linkage between them. So the covalent bond is an alpha-1-4 linkage. Here's glycogen. This is how we store carbohydrate. So starch is how plants store carbohydrates. Glycogen is how animals store carbohydrates. And glycogen has alpha-1-4 linkages, just like starch, and 1-6 linkages, right? And that causes branching. Obviously, we have the enzymes to break alpha-1-4, and 1,6s, because we have the enzymes to make those covalent bonds. So we have the enzymes to break them. So we can readily break down glycogen, and we can readily break down starch. Okay, cellulose, the glucose molecules, are held together by beta 1,4 linkages, and we do not have the enzymes to break those covalent bonds. Okay, so cellulose is indigestible to us. Bacteria in our large intestine do have the enzymes. Okay, so they will digest some of the cellulose. 
However, we don't digest any of the cellulose in our small intestine. But we're supposed to eat a diet high in fiber or cellulose to keep those bacteria in our large intestines happy, right? Because they do a lot of stuff for us besides digesting fiber. Okay, any questions about carbohydrates? Hey, okay, let's talk about lipids then. Lipids are nonpolar. Okay, carbohydrates are polar molecules, lipids are nonpolar. Anything nonpolar is hydrophobic, afraid of water, okay, or lipophilic, really likes lipids. Okay, they don't dissolve in water. We're going to talk about three main types, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. And we'll talk about phospholipids in even more detail next week when we talk about transport through the plasma membrane. Okay, so triglycerides are a glycerol molecule outlined in yellow here and three fatty acids. So each one of these outlined in the red is a fatty acid. And fatty acids can either be saturated, unsaturated, or polyunsaturated. So here we have two fatty acids. And saturated means each carbon molecule is saturated with two hydrogens. Okay, so saturated fats, the carbons, are saturated with hydrogens. Because they're saturated with hydrogens, they're stiff and they're straight. And they're solid at room temperature. Okay, so saturated fat is solid at room temperature because it's stiff. Unsaturated fatty acids, here we have two carbons that are sharing a double bond with each other and therefore can only bind with one hydrogen each. Okay, so they are unsaturated with hydrogens. Unsaturated fat, right, we've got these kinks in the tail, they're more fluid. So unsaturated fat is liquid at room temperature. Okay, so butter. Does butter have lots of saturated or unsaturated fat? Saturated fat. Okay, that's because animals are really good at saturating fat. Okay, whereas olive oil, is it unsaturated or saturated? Unsaturated, because it's liquid at room temperature. So which one are you supposed to eat more of? Olive oil. Olive oil, right? Because these fatty acids... We'll store them as triglycerides, but we'll also use these fatty acids in our phospholipids, which make up our plasma membranes. And do you think you want fluid plasma membranes or stiff plasma membranes? Fluid ones, okay? And animals can saturate, animals like humans can saturate no problem. So if you eat too much unsaturated fat, you'll just saturate it, no big deal. But if you too, eat too much saturated fat, we don't have the enzymes to unsaturate it. Does that make sense? We can saturate fat, but we can't unsaturate fat. And we need unsaturated fat for our phospholipids, for our plasma membranes. To keep them nice and fluid. Okay, polyunsaturated is just when you have multiple covalent bonds, more than just one. Okay, you might also know those as the PUFAs, right? If you eat a lot of fish, you get a lot of PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Okay, we use triglycerides for an energy source, really high in calories, right, as well as energy storage. We store the vast majority of energy as fat, right? Plants can store a lot of energy as carbohydrates, right, because starch requires water. In order to store carbohydrates, you also have to store water, and that's heavy, okay? When you store fat, you can be nice and light. So animals want to store fat so that we can move around. Plants will store starch because they are stationary, right? Oh, that's just circling that double bond there. Okay, so here we have a triglyceride where all the fatty acids are saturated. So they're straight and stiff. Okay, this will be solid at room temperature. And here we have unsaturated fatty acids, and those double bonds are causing those kinks. And because of those kinks, they can't pack together, so they maintain fluidity. Right, so liquid at room temperature. 
Okay, the second type of lipid is phospholipids. So phospholipids, again, we have a glycerol, just like in triglycerides. But now we only have two fatty acids. Okay, so phospholipids are a glycerol, two fatty acids, and then a phosphate group, which is charged. Okay, so phospholipids are both nonpolar and polar at the same time. And molecules that are both polar and nonpolar are called amphipathic. Amphipathic molecules are both polar and nonpolar. Okay, and this amphipathic nature of phospholipids allows them to form the phospholipid bilayer that makes up our plasma membranes. Okay. So here we've got a phospholipid. Here's that polar head region being shown as a circle. And the two squiggly lines are the two fatty acid tails. Okay, and again, we want unsaturated fatty acids so that they maintain fluidity because we want our plasma membranes to be fluid. So spontaneously in water, because of their amphipathic nature, phospholipids form a bilayer where the polar head regions interact with water. This would be extracellular fluid. And here, the polar head regions are interacting with intracellular fluid. And then the fatty acid tails are hanging out with each other because they hate water. Okay? This forms a barrier for our cells. So only substances that are hydrophobic will just dissolve and pass through the plasma membrane. Anything that's hydrophilic or polar can't cross and therefore has to be transported and therefore can be regulated. And we'll talk about that in detail next week when we talk about transport through the plasma membrane. Okay, the last type of lipid we're going to talk about are steroids. Steroids are signaling molecules. Okay, they are made up of four carbon rings. So here's carbon ring one, carbon ring two, carbon ring three, and carbon ring four. And all steroids are synthesized from cholesterol. Right, so cholesterol is the building block for our steroid hormones. So here we have estrogen, testosterone. Who knows another example of a steroid hormone? I hear some mumbling. No one wants to give a guess. Thyroid hormone is lipophilic, but not a steroid hormone. Yeah. Estrogen and what's the other female reproductive <coughs> hormone? Progesterone is an example of a steroid hormone. Okay, cortisol is a steroid hormone and aldosterone. Okay, and we'll talk about the steroid hormones when we talk about the endocrine system much later in the semester. Okay, steroids are hydrophobic and therefore can freely cross plasma membranes. Okay, so steroid hormones can be given as patches, right? Because they'll just cross through epithelial cells. Okay, any questions about the lipids? Right, let's talk about the proteins then. Okay, so proteins are long chains of amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. We use 20 different amino acids to make all the proteins in our bodies. Okay, all amino acids have an amino group. That's the portion that contains nitrogen. This is what gets clipped off to use the rest of the amino acid for energy production. Okay, so we've got the amino group. And then each amino acid has a carboxyl group. Remember that carboxyl group will give off that hydrogen ion. And this is what makes proteins negatively charged. Okay, there's a central carbon for all amino acids that's bonded to a hydrogen atom, and then it shares a bond with what's called a side chain. And these side chains are what are different between the 20 amino acids. Okay, so each amino acid has a different side chain. So I put this table in, because it shows you all the amino acids, but don't freak out, you don't have to memorize them until you take biochemistry, okay? This lists all the amino acids, so the full name, alanine, Okay, and then the three-letter abbreviation, the one-letter abbreviation, and it's just saying it's molecular weight, okay? And then in green here is where we see the R groups. 
So this is what's different between each amino acid. Each one has a carboxyl group, and see they've taken that hydrogen off. Okay, and each one has an amino group. And then the side chains differ. Okay, some side chains are nonpolar. Some side chains are polar and acidic, meaning they have hydrogen ions that they will give off. And some side chains are polar and basic because they'll take up hydrogen ions, and some are polar but uncharged. Okay? But don't worry about memorizing them. Just that they all have different R groups or side chains, and that gives them their different properties. So would we want to like, memorize the R groups? No. No. Not until biochemistry. No reason to do it now. Yep. Unless you really want to. If you're looking for something to memorize. Okay. Really want to fill that brain up. Okay. So amino acids form bonds to one another. And those covalent bonds get a special name. It's called a peptide bond. So the covalent bond between two amino acids is a peptide bond. Okay, and short chains of amino acids are called peptides. Long chains of amino acids are proteins. Okay, so we've got amino acid one here and amino acid two here. And notice we're not even looking at the side chains. Okay, but the carboxyl group in amino acid one is going to interact with the amino group and via dehydration synthesis, so we're going to move, remove a water, we're going to form a covalent bond, which called, is called a peptide bond. Okay, so energy is going to be required to do this reaction. And where does this reaction occur? Who remembers from last week? No, but thank you for giving a guess. The rough ER. The rough ER, and specifically what on the rough ER does this reaction? Ribosomes. Okay, remember I said most enzymes are proteins, but there are examples of RNA enzymes. So the ribosomes are made up of ribosomal RNA, and they act as an enzyme, and they do dehydration synthesis to make peptide bonds. Okay, and those ribosomes are either in the rough ER or they're just in the cytosol. Remember, ribosomes can be found in those two places. Okay. What type of RNA is bringing the amino acids? tRNA. And what kind of RNA is bringing the three-letter code telling the ribosome which amino acid it needs? mRNA. Okay, so what the heck do proteins do for us? Not much. Just kidding. Tons. Okay, most enzymes are proteins, except for the ribosomes. There we've got some RNA enzymes going on. But otherwise, most enzymes are proteins, and enzymes catalyze or speed up chemical reactions. Our proteins help defend us. So immunoglobins or antibodies are proteins. Okay. They help defend us from viruses and bacteria, etc. Okay, proteins help transport things. So hemoglobin, which transports oxygen in the bloodstream, is a protein. All the transporters we're going to talk about next week are proteins. Okay, proteins give support. So collagen, keratin, fibrin. So both the cytoskeleton is made up of protein as well as the extracellular matrix is made up of protein. Okay, so it gives support. It allows us to have motion. So if you're low in protein, what are you supposed to eat? If your diet's low in protein, you're supposed to eat more meat, because meat is muscle. Muscle is primarily protein, okay? Actin and myosin are proteins. Okay, proteins do regulation, so they help regulate what genes get turned on and turned off, so transcribed, okay? And then the vast majority of your hormones are peptides. Peptide hormones are the most common type of hormone. Okay, and then proteins also store things for us. So they'll bind iron, ions, like iron. Okay, so ferritin, which stores iron in our liver, is a protein. Okay, so proteins have huge numbers of roles within our cells. Our cells are chock full of proteins because they're doing the work of our cells. 
Hey, the structure of proteins is determined by the sequence of amino acids. Okay, those amino acids held together by <clears throat> peptide bonds is the primary structure. So ribosomes make the primary structure. Okay, and then the folding of the protein is the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So generally that folding occurs in what organelle? Who remembers what organelle folds our proteins? The Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus. Okay, so primary structure is just that long chain of amino acids held together by peptide bonds. When a protein denatures, it does not lose its primary structure. I'm going to repeat that because people always miss the question about this. When a protein denatures, it does not lose its primary structure. Okay, temperature and pH changes do not break the peptide bonds. Okay, the peptide bonds are covalent. They're really strong. So when a protein denatures, it doesn't lose its primary structure. Okay, and it gets its primary structure in the ribosomes. Okay, secondary structure is the initial folding into either alpha helixes or beta pleated sheets. And it's due to what's called hydrogen bonding, which are weak interactions. Hydrogen bonds are weak. Okay, remember hydrogen's a wimpy atom. It's only got a single proton in there. It can't hold on to the electron it shares very well. So the larger atom it's sharing its electron with hogs it. So hydrogen often has a net positive charge. And then it'll interact with other molecules that have net negative charges. So those are hydrogen bonds. These are easily disrupted. So changes in temperature and or pH will disrupt secondary structure because the hydrogen bonds are weak. Tertiary structure is the three-dimensional shape brought together by either van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonds, or ionic bonds. Or tertiary structure can also involve some covalent bonds between sulfur-containing amino acids. And these are called disulfide bridges. And proteins that might undergo a lot of heating tend to have loads of disulfide bridges, right, so that they retain their structure. Because those covalent bonds are strong. Van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonds, and ionic bonds are all weak non-covalent interactions that are disrupted due to changes in temperature and pH. Okay, so these are all weak. Talked about hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonds is when a molecule is completely given off an electron, becomes a positive charge, and then the other one's completely taken an electron, becomes negatively charged. So positive and negative love to hang out together. So that's an ionic bond. Van der Waals forces are due to the fact that electrons are always moving around atoms. And sometimes they're on one side, and sometimes they're on the other side. When they're on one side, that side has a little negative charge, the other side has a little positive charge, but then the electron moves really fast, and then the other side becomes net negative charge. Okay, so they're really weak forces. They're due to momentary dipoles. Okay, so Van der Waals forces are the weakest. Okay, hey, quaternary structure is where you have multiple polypeptide chains interacting with one another. So many proteins are actually multiple polypeptide chains interacting with one another by weak non-covalent interactions, which get disrupted due to changes in temperature and pH. And what molecules on the screen? Anyone recognize that? Hemoglobin, exactly. Hemoglobin involves four polypeptide chains. Each one has a heme group, which is being shown in yellow here. Okay, we maintain a stable internal body temperature and a stable pH to keep our proteins folded and happy. And increases in temperature and changes in pH will cause our proteins to denature. And when they denature, they unfold. But they maintain their primary structure. Okay, all the weak non-covalent interactions get disrupted. 
Okay, all the van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, get disrupted, the protein unfolds, but it maintains those peptide bonds between the amino acids. So when I tell you a protein has denatured, it is just unfolded. Okay, it has not undergone hydrolysis. In order to break peptide bonds, you need hydrolytic enzymes. Okay, not just changes in temperature or pH. Okay, any questions about that? Denaturation or protein folding? Yeah. The bridges were covalent bonds, were those we broke the temperature? No, those remain. And so that protein might be able to get refolded. Yep. That was your question. Back row. Um, so I'm just curious. So is it possible for different um, proteins to have the same primary structure and have different secondary or tertiary structures? And so same amino acid chain that serves a different person, purpose as well. No. So proteins, in order to fold differently, have to have a different primary structure. Yeah, because the primary structure determines how it's going to fold. And if it has a slightly different primary structure, then it will fold slightly differently. So you may get proteins that serve the exact same function, but have slightly different structures and therefore fold slightly differently, and therefore do the enzymatic reactions at slightly different rates. Right? That happens a lot. Yep. Okay, we'll finish there today. And then talk about nucleotides and cellular metabolism on Friday. All right, we were talking about proteins, okay? And proteins are long chains of amino acids that get folded into a functional unit. And many proteins, their function is to act as enzymes. Right? And enzymes speed up or catalyze chemical reactions. Right? They make or break covalent bonds. And they can do that same reaction over and over and over again. Okay? So they are not consumed in the process. Okay? They can do that reaction many times. Generally, enzymes are pretty specific and can bind one to just a few substrates. There are examples of enzymes that have a much larger variety of substrates, but in general, enzymes are really specific. So lactase is the enzyme that either breaks down or makes lactose. <coughs> so its substrate is glucose and galactose if it's making lactose, or its substrate is lactose if it's breaking it down. Okay, so enzymes can do the forward as well as the reverse reaction. It all just depends on needs of the cell, right? Enzymes have an active site to bind the substrate. Once the substrate binds, it's called the enzyme substrate complex, and that causes the product to be formed. Okay? Enzymes allow chemical reactions to occur at physiologically relevant temperatures and pH. Okay, so here we have an enzyme that's being shown as a cup, and we have a, an active site that binds the substrate. So in this case, the substrate is let's say a disaccharide okay so let's say this enzyme is lactase okay so the enzyme is lactase and in this reaction the substrate is lactose lactose is the disaccharide okay so lactose binds to lactase and this occurs in some of your gi tracts okay if you're lactose tolerant you're producing lactase into adulthood okay so you still have lactase in your small intestine it's binding to the lactose you're taking in when you drink milk or eat cheese Okay, it <coughs> breaks the covalent bond between glucose and galactose. Okay, so in this case, the substrate is lactose, and the products are glucose and galactose. Lactase is then free or available to do the reaction again. Okay. Is this an example of dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis? Hydrolysis, exactly. The covalent bond is being broken by the addition of water. So you could put water on this side of the equation, 
And then where does energy go? Does it go to cause the reaction or is it a product of the reaction? Product. It's a product of the reaction. Okay, down here we just have the reverse. So here we have glucose and galactose. So this is what is occurring in the mammary glands. Okay, so in mammary glands, lactase forms a covalent bond between glucose and galactose. And the product in this case is lactose. And then that enzyme lactase is available to do the reaction again. So is this an example of dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis? The reverse is always going to be dehydration synthesis, the making of a covalent bond. Okay, so water is a product. Because you're taking water off in order to make that covalent bond. And energy is needed. Okay, so the making of lactose requires energy. The breaking of lactose into glucose and galactose releases energy. Okay, we're just going to do very basics on enzymes. Yeah? Do those enzymes ever break down where they can't do that job anymore? Oh, definitely. And then they have to be replaced. Okay. Yep. I was just wondering. Yeah, so the lactose or the lactase you produced when you were two years old is long gone, long gone, okay? Yeah, the digestive enzymes that we actually secrete into our stomach or into the small intestine, lactase actually ends up on, it stays on the um, brush border of the epithelial membrane, so it actually sits on the membrane, so it stays a lot longer than the ones we actually secrete into the lumen of the GI tract. Those we actually digest right away. Okay. Any questions about proteins or enzymes? Okay, let's move on and talk about last biomolecule or macromolecule, which are the nucleotides. Okay, so nucleotides have a pentose, Okay, a five carbon carbohydrate, a nitrogenous base, and one or more phosphate groups. So here's that pentose, that five carbon carbohydrate. Here's a phosphate group, and here's the nitrogenous base. That nitrogenous base is either going to be cytosine, thymine, uracil, adenine, or guanine. Okay, and the nitrogenous base, if we're talking about DNA and RNA, that's being shown here in parentheses is the one letter code. Right? So if you've ever seen a gene sequence written out, it's a bunch of C's, T's, A's, G's, etc. Okay? And that's where those letters are coming from, saying which nitrogenous base is on that nucleotide. Nucleotides play two major roles. One is there are genetic material, so there are blueprint. That's DNA and RNA, and we'll talk briefly about them. But for this class, we're really interested in ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Okay, ATP is used to transfer energy within the cell. Okay, vast majority of ATP is made in the mitochondria, and then it's used by enzymes, transporters, etc., within the cell to do work. Okay, so ATP is the energy currency. And so ATP is adenin adenosine, so it has an adenine as the nitrogenous base. Sugar is ribose. And then ATP has three phosphate groups. That's where the tri comes from. Okay, those phosphate groups are charged, right? And negative charges don't want to be next to each other. So if you're playing with magnets, you know how the poles will repel each other, okay? Same thing with these phosphate groups. They don't want to be next to each other. And so forming these covalent bonds, right, they are really easy to break. Those phosphate groups want to be liberated. And when they break, you get this really big release of energy. Okay, so what the mitochondria is doing is it's breaking covalent bonds between carbon molecules in either carbohydrates, lipids, or amino acids. When it breaks those covalent bonds, you get a release of energy. And the mitochondria is harnessing that energy in the form of covalent bonds between phosphate groups. And then the rest of the molecules in our cells can break those covalent bonds and get this really nice release of energy. 
Okay, so just exchanging the energy held in covalent bonds between carbon molecules for covalent bonds between phosphate molecules. And we're going to talk about how ATP is made in mitochondria today. Okay, most energy exchanges in the cell outside the mitochondria involve clipping off phosphate groups. So here is adenosine triphosphate. Each of these purple circles is a phosphate group. So triphosphate has three phosphate groups. Okay, usually it's just the outermost phosphate group that gets clipped off. So you go between ATP and ADP. Okay, but in cells that are doing a lot of work, right, will clip off that second phosphate group and form AMP, adenosine monophosphate, okay, with only one phosphate group. And you can't clip off that last phosphate group. Okay. But in general, we're just going between ATP and ADP. Okay, so at rest, our cells are putting a phosphate group, so this PI is a phosphate group, onto ADP. They're using energy to put that in. This is occurring mainly in the mitochondria, and they're forming ATP. Okay, that ATP then is exported out of the mitochondria, and when the cells do work, that phosphate group gets clipped off. You get a release of energy because you're breaking a covalent bond, and then that ADP can be used again. But first, it has to have a phosphate group be put back on. Okay, so at rest, making ATP. When doing work, making AT, no, ADP. Did I say ADP here? At rest, making <coughs> ATP. When working, making ADP. Okay, so just shuttling a phosphate group on and off of adenosine diphosphate. Okay. Polymers of nucleotides are called nucleic acids. Okay, so ATP is not a polymer, so it's just a nucleotide. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids. So they're polymers of nucleotides. Okay, DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. Okay, where is DNA found inside cells? In the nucleus. Okay, and then RNA is transcribed from DNA. And we have three kinds of RNA, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. Okay, messenger RNA does what? It acts, it acts as the message, so it codes for the proteins. Ribosomal RNA does what? Forms the ribosomes, and what do the ribosomes do? It makes the proteins by reading the messenger RNA and then forming the peptide bonds between amino acids. And then what does transfer RNA do? Brings the amino acids. Brings the amino acids. Okay. DNA ultimately codes for RNA. Right? And we notice here we've got the different nitrogenous groups. Adenine interacts with thymine. Okay, so an A in the DNA will code for a T in the RNA, and then guanine interacts with cytosine. Okay, any questions about biomolecules? Yes? Actually, um, well, DNA, is it possible for them to, um, see, so it's like adenine and guanine, right? Uh -huh. It, yes, it is possible that that would be an error, right? Yeah. Okay, so coding problems do occur. Mutations do occur. Yep. Okay. All right. Any other questions about biomolecules before we talk about cellular respiration? Okay. Right, so we're going to finish off cellular metabolism by talking about cellular respiration and energy metabolism. So this is information from chapter three. Okay, so cellular respiration is harvesting of energy from the breakdown of organic molecules. Organic molecules being carbon-containing molecules. Okay, so we break covalent bonds between carbon molecules and then harvest that energy in the form of ATP. Okay, the overall process can be summarized as one mole of glucose 
uses six moles of oxygen, okay, and produces six moles of carbon dioxide, six moles of water, plus energy. And that energy is in the form of ATP as well as heat because it's not 100% efficient. Okay, so we get some amount of heat production as well. Okay, you can follow all the carbons. So we have six carbons in glucose. All six of those carbons get exhaled as carbon dioxide. Okay, we have six oxygens plus another 12. <coughs> okay, and 12 of those get released as carbon dioxide and six as water. Okay, and then hydrogen, we have 12 hydrogens. Here's 12 hydrogens in the water. Okay, so the stoichiometry is None of those molecules are lost, they're just changed, okay? We breathe because we need to take in oxygen to do cellular respiration, okay? And then we also breathe to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Okay, the sequence of steps that we're gonna talk about in burning one mole of glucose is the first step is glycolysis, Second step is the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle is also known as the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. They're all the same cycle. They just have three different names. Okay, so Krebs cycle, TCA cycle, citric acid cycle, all the same thing. And then the electron transport chain. Okay, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. Krebs cycle and electron transport chain occur in the mitochondria. All right, so here we have the interior of the cell, so the cytoplasm or cytosol, and we've got a molecule of glucose. Glucose has six carbons. Okay, it's under, gonna undergo a series of reactions which we call glycolysis. Okay, so glycolysis isn't just one reaction, it's a series of reactions, but you don't have to memorize all the steps. When you take biochemistry, you will. Okay, a little bit of ATP gets made during glycolysis, but not much. Okay. Some NADH gets formed, right? And what this NADH is doing is it's carrying electrons that were released during the enzymatic process, and it's going to carry those electrons to the electron transport chain. Okay. Glucose gets converted into pyruvate. Glucose is six carbons, pyruvate is three carbons. Okay, so glycolysis, the end product, is one molecule of glucose gets clipped into two pyruvates. We haven't lost any carbons yet. Okay, pyruvate is then going to enter the mitochondria. Remember the mitochondria has those two membranes? Okay, it undergoes what's called pyruvate oxidation and a carbon gets clipped off. So here we have our first molecule of CO2 being formed. Those electrons get picked up by NADH. Okay. Pyruvate gets converted to acetyl-CoA. So pyruvate is three carbons, acetyl-CoA is two carbons, and then it undergoes a series of reactions which are called the Krebs cycle. And the rest of the carbon dioxide gets clipped off. Okay, so we've finally broken all the covalent bonds between the carbon molecules. A little bit of ATP gets made, electrons get picked up, they get delivered to the electron transport chain. Okay. Oxygen takes up those electrons and is converted into water. And this is where the vast majority of ATP gets made. So we're gonna talk about each step. All right? Yeah. The NADH and the FADH, do we need to know anything about those outside of this, this part of this process at certain points? Yes, we'll need to know that they are electron carriers. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep, they're the electron carriers. Okay, they're known as what's called cofactors. So NADH and FADH are made from the B vitamins. That's why all those energy drinks are chock full of B vitamins, right? In the hopes that you'll do more cellular respiration and have more energy, okay? You'll just probably get diabetes because there's so much sugar in those things. <laughs> okay, so the first step is glycolysis. And I really like this. I pulled it from a different textbook. Your textbook goes through all of the enzymatic reactions, but I'm not going to hold you accountable to all the enzymatic reactions. What I want you to know is glucose is a six-carbon molecule. 
there's a series of enzymatic reactions. A little ATP gets put in, okay? So one of the steps requires ATP, and ultimately four ATP get formed. So the net yield is two, okay? Two get put, get put in, four are produced, four minus two is two, okay? Hopefully you follow my math. And then two NADH get produced as well. So NAD picks up an electron as well as a proton. So that's why it becomes NADH. So it picks up the entire hydrogen atom. Okay. But the most important part is that it's picking up that electron. But the hydrogen comes with it as well. So that's why it goes from NAD positive to NADH. So it's taking both the electron as well as the hydrogen. Okay, the yield for glycolysis is two three-carbon pyruvates. Okay, this process of glycolysis occurs in the cytosol and does not require oxygen. It will run without oxygen. Okay, so these bullet points are telling you the key features you need to know. Occurs in the cytoplasm or cytosol, does not require oxygen, yields 2 ATP and 2 NADH. Okay, it's the conversion of 6 carbon glucose into 2 3 carbon pyruvates. Any questions so far? Okay, again, your textbook goes into way more detail. Right, if oxygen is not available, you'll do what is called anaerobic respiration. Okay, so that you can continue to produce some ATP. So you'll continue to do glycolysis, but you won't be able to do anything in the mitochondria if oxygen's not available. Okay, what happens is that the pyruvate is going to pick up the hydrogen and electron from NADH to regenerate the NAD. So that glycolysis can occur. Because that NAD positive is a cofactor for some of the enzymatic reactions. If you don't have NAD positive, you're not gonna be able to do glycolysis. And in order to be able to do glycolysis, that NADH has to have somewhere to give that electron to. So it gives it to pyruvate and converts it into lactate. So notice here we just have an oxygen, and in lactate we have a hydroxyl group here. Okay, so that's where that electron and proton went. Lactate is also known as lactic acid. And where do you make lactic acid? What cells? Muscle cells, exactly. And do you make it in your muscle cells when you're just walking around and doing easy exercise? Oh, the first week of New Year's. First week of New Year's when everyone decides to go to the gym, right? <laughs> and haven't exercised since last New Year's. <laughs> so you produce lactic acid for intense burst exercise, right? when you're using muscle cells that don't have a lot of mitochondria, right, and they're big and bulky. So if you're a well-trained bodybuilder, okay, you'll produce some lactic acid. Are you pointing at your neighbor? Is he a bodybuilder? Oh, okay, good. No. <laughs> All right. Or if you are making muscles that normally don't do a lot of contraction, contract really hard, right? You'll produce lactic acid. Can you produce lactic acid indefinitely? Can you keep doing that intensive an exercise for a long period of time? No, okay, so lactic acid will disrupt the pH within the cells, okay, and you'll basically stop doing that muscle contraction. It causes fatigue, and it causes fatigue really rapidly. Then that lactic acid has to be exported out of the muscle cell, and then it's gonna go to the liver and be converted back into pyruvate, okay? So you don't pee out the lactic acid, you then convert it back to pyruvate and then take it through aerobic respiration, okay? But that process takes a little while, right? And also cause in, causes inflammation, which is what leads to that muscle soreness the next day, okay? Or a couple days later. Right, <clears throat> there are organisms like yeast that convert the pyruvate into acetaldehyde during anaerobic fermentation. And then some of them convert it even further to ethanol, 
right? So this is also anaerobic. We just don't have the enzymatic processes to convert it all the way to ethanol. Did you know goldfish can? So goldfish can make ethanol when they're in a low oxygen environment. So if you have a goldfish and you don't clean their water regularly and it gets super skunky, they'll actually convert their pyruvate all the way into ethanol. And then that will just diffuse into the water. Okay, so you can make some bathtub hooch with really gross goldfish water. Don't do it, because they also poop in there. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Anyway, don't, also don't try to hold your breath and think that maybe you'll make some ethanol. You won't. Okay, so we can do anaerobic respiration in order to make a little bit of ATP. So for each molecule of glucose, we'll make two ATP anaerobically. If we do aerobic and take that pyruvate or pyruvic acid into the mitochondria, so here's that double membrane in the mitochondria, and do the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle or TCA cycle, whatever you like to call it, an electron transport, we'll make an additional 34 ATP. Okay, so aerobic respiration is much more efficient. It just means you have to have mitochondria, right? a good supply of oxygen, and time. So this is why intense muscle exercise or muscle contraction will go anaerobic, okay? Because those muscles don't have the time. They need the ATP right away. So this is way fast, okay? This is slower but much more efficient. So when you're doing less intense muscle contraction, like going up for a leisurely walk, you replenish all your ATP aerobically. And you can do that for hours and hours and hours because right? you don't have lactic acid building up. Okay, so let's talk about what the heck is happening inside the mitochondria. Okay, first up is the Krebs cycle. Okay, <clears throat> so again, I like this figure because it's showing the carbons. Okay, so remember we have pyruvic oxidation. So pyruvate was three carbons. One of those carbons gets clipped off and the product is acetyl-CoA. For each glucose, we get two pyruvic acids. So for each glucose, we get two acetyl-CoA's. So that means each glucose spins the citric acid cycle twice. Okay. Those two carbons are going to leave as carbon dioxide. So here's one carbon leaving. Here's the second carbon leaving. Okay. Don't worry about all these intermediaries. Okay. Here's NAD+. Plus picking up an electron. Okay, here's NAD+, plus, picking up an electron. Here's FAD, picking up electrons. Here's NAD+, plus, picking up some electrons. Okay, so that's where all the hydrogens are going. So the carbons are leaving as carbon dioxide. The hydrogens are being picked up by NAD and FAD. Okay, and then we make a little bit of ATP as well. Okay, so one molecule of ATP gets made during the Krebs cycle. But because glucose spins it twice, you get two ATP. Okay, so the important parts to remember about the Krebs cycle is that it takes place in the mitochondria, and in specific, the matrix. Yes? What do you mean it spins it twice? Okay, so one glucose becomes two pyruvates. Okay. Each one of those pyruvates becomes an acetyl-CoA. So one glucose makes two acetyl-CoAs. Each acetyl-CoA spins the cycle oh, once. Okay. Yeah. Or the wheel, or whatever you want to call it. Think of Vanna White spinning the, or just Pat Sajak spin the wheel. She turns the letters, right? right? It's been a long time since I watched Wheel of Fortune. Okay. It requires oxygen. Okay, oxygen's nowhere in this cycle. Okay, it doesn't directly require oxygen. It indirectly requires oxygen because these NADHs and FADH2s have to give their hydrogens and electrons to the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain only runs if oxygen is available. So the Krebs cycle only runs if oxygen is available. Okay. The mitochondria does not have the enzymes to make lactic acid. 
Okay, the only way it can regenerate the NAD plus and the FAD is to run the electron transport chain. The only way to run the electron transport chain is with oxygen available. Okay, so the Krebs cycle indirectly requires oxygen. Anything that occurs inside the mitochondria requires oxygen. Okay, and per glucose molecule, we make six NADHs because each spin makes three, two FADH2s because each spin makes one, and two ATPs because each spin makes one ATP. Okay, so we make a little bit of ATP. Mainly, we're getting those electrons. Okay. All the carbon has now been clipped apart and is going to leave the cell as carbon dioxide. Okay, let's talk about the last step, the electron transport chain. Okay, so NADH and FADH2 that were formed in the Krebs cycle, pyruvate oxidation, and glycolysis. Okay, so if oxygen is available, the NADH formed during glycolysis is going to enter the mitochondria. Okay, they are going to give their electrons to the electron transport chain. So here we have the mitochondria, and it has those two membranes. Remember, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. <coughs> the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane is known as the intermembrane space. Nice and descriptive. It's between the two membranes. Okay, the space inside the inner membrane is known as the matrix. So here, this is the inner membrane being shown. The electron transport chain occurs on the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay, which is separating the matrix from the intermembrane space. Okay, each one of these blue circles is a hydrogen ion. Okay, so H positive, which is also just a proton. Right, because hydrogen is a proton and an electron. And it's given its electron to the electron transport chain. So now it's just a proton or a hydrogen ion. Okay, so what's happening is those electrons that were picked up by NADH and FADH2 are going to power what are called proton pumps. So proton pump one, three, and four. Okay, electrons are high energy. Okay. So they give the energy needed to the proton pumps to move the protons or hydrogen ions from where they're in low concentration, which is in the matrix, to where they're in high concentration, which is in the intermembrane space. Okay, so they're pumping those hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient due to the energy of the electrons. Okay. When you have a lot of hydrogen ions, what does that affect? Acidity. Acidity, right? The pH. pH is a measure of the number of hydrogen ions. So is the intermembrane space acidic or basic? Acidic. It's really acidic. Okay, because it has all those protons. Okay, so guess where the Krebs cycle occurs? Do you think it occurs in the intermembrane space or in the matrix? In the matrix, right? Because most proteins like a neutral pH. Okay. Too many hydrogen ions, they don't work as well. So the matrix occurs, or the Krebs cycle occurs in the matrix because it's at a neutral pH. That intermembrane space is highly acidic. Okay, the electron transport chain sets up a proton gradient where you have loads of protons or hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space, very few in the matrix. This means the protons really want to get back into the matrix. They hate being crowded. Okay. They want to get back into the matrix so badly that when ATP synthase lets them back in, it gives ATP synthase the energy needed to make ATP. Okay, So the electron transport chain is running proton pumps which set up a proton gradient. That proton gradient gets used by ATP synthase to make ATP, right? By letting the protons back into the matrix, that gives ATP synthase the 
energy needed to add a phosphate group and form a covalent bond between ADP and that phosphate group to make ATP. Okay, we're almost done. Those electrons and protons have to go somewhere, right? The electrons, two electrons and two protons, get picked up by an oxygen atom and become water. Okay. This is the role of oxygen in your body. It picks up electrons and protons from the electron transport chain and is converted into water. Okay. This is the role of oxygen in your body. This is why we have a respiratory system, to bring in oxygen. It's why we have a circulatory system, to deliver the oxygen. It's why we have hemoglobin, to carry the oxygen. Right? So that it can diffuse into the mitochondria into the matrix, pick up protons and electrons, and become water, right? Oxygen is what is known as the terminal electron acceptor. Without oxygen, electron transport doesn't run. Without electron transport, Krebs cycle doesn't run, okay? The only way cells have to make ATP is glycolysis, but it produces lactic acid, okay? So it's only going to last for a short period of time. Okay, questions? Yeah, you guys are good with it? Okay, so just a summary of the actual making of ATP. We've got those proton pumps, so you're using the energy from the electrons to make the proton gradient. And then ATP synthase allows the protons to come back into the matrix from the intermembrane space where they're way overcrowded. And that drives the synthesis of ATP by a process called chemiosmosis. What is osmosis? Probably you've heard of osmosis before. Osmosis is the movement of water. water. Okay, so chemiosmosis is the movement of a chemical that's not water. Okay, so chemiosmosis is letting the protons from the intermembrane space into the matrix. They want to get so badly back into the matrix that it actually run the reaction of converting ADP plus phosphate into ATP. Okay, so this proton gradient Last thing I'm going to say, proton gradient is a source of potential energy. Yeah? So I read in an article a while ago that mitochondria might have been a bacteria that our cells ingested at some point. Exactly. That's yeah. So mitochondria, the reason why we think this is because mitochondria have their own DNA and replicate themselves. Okay? So way, way back when eukaryotes evolved. So this is way back in evolution. The early eukaryotes probably engulfed bacterial cells that then became mitochondria, okay? Our mitochondria can't live outside of our cells, right? They have to live inside of our cells, but they make, remake themselves, okay? They have their own DNA. We don't code for our mitochondria. So this means, the cool thing about mitochondria too is all your mitochondria came from your mother, okay? So the oocyte that became you was chock full of mitochondria, and your father's sperm just donated chromosomes, no mitochondria, okay? So all the mitochondria in you are derived from your mother's mitochondria. And they're now treating mitochondrial diseases in um, embryos, right? They're sucking out the mitochondria from the mother that has a mitochondrial disease and putting in someone else's mitochondria, which is pretty cool. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So here's a summary of cellular respiration. Okay, glucose undergoes glycolysis. So six carbon glucose becomes two, three carbon pyruvates. This occurs in the cytosol. So notice we're outside of the mitochondria at this point. We only make two ATP and two NADH. Okay, then pyruvate is going to come into the mitochondria undergo pyruvate oxidation, which isn't being shown here, and become acetyl-CoA, which is two carbons. So two pyruvate become two acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA will run the Krebs cycle, 
Okay, we get a little NADH from the transition, i.e. pyruvate oxidation. That's what their transition reaction is. Okay, Krebs cycle makes six NADH and two FADH2. And what this figure is showing you is showing you how many ATP each one of these molecules make, right? You don't need to know that detail, okay? Just showing four ATP, 18, six, four, for a total of 32. So electron transport makes 32 ATP. Krebs cycle makes two, glycolysis makes two. So electron transport makes the vast majority of ATP. Okay. Right, so let's see if this video sounds like a chipmunk, and if it does, we'll go to YouTube. Mountain biker heads up the trail. The breakfast he ate this morning is being burnt to power his bike ride. His breathing rate increases as his leg muscles demand more oxygen to burn more fuel. Let's zoom down to where this fuel is burnt, our cells. Here, the blood vessel on the left delivers fuel and oxygen to a single muscle cell. In cellular respiration, energy and fuel is converted to ATP, shown here as starbursts. Most ATP is made in the cell's mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the cell, such as contraction. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons to reactions in the mitochondria. In the final steps of glycolysis, some ATP is produced, but not much. For every glucose molecule, only two net ATPs are produced outside the mitochondria. However, glycolysis has produced pyruvic acid, which still has a lot of energy available. Let's follow this pyruvic acid molecule into a mitochondria to see where most of the energy is extracted. As the molecule enters the mitochondria, one carbon is removed, forming carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Electrons are stripped, forming NADH. Coenzyme A attaches to the two-carbon fragment, forming acetyl-CoA. Coenzyme A is removed, and the remaining two-carbon skeleton is attached to an existing four-carbon molecule that serves as the starting point for the citric acid cycle. The new six-carbon chain is partially broken down, releasing carbon dioxide. Several electrons are captured by electron carriers, and more carbon dioxide is released. The carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from the reactions of cellular respiration. Two ATPs are produced by the citric acid cycle for each molecule of glucose. At this point, only a small number of ATPs have been produced. However, more energy is available in the electrons that are being transported by electron carriers. While the citric acid cycle starts another round, let's follow an electron carrier to the next step in the process. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the next in the electron transport chain. Let's take a closer look at the path electrons take through the chain. As electrons move along each step of the chain, they give up a bit of energy. The oxygen you breathe pulls electrons from the transport chain, and water is formed as a byproduct. The energy released by electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, creating an area of high hydrogen ion concentration. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine, much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. The process you've just observed, cellular respiration, 
generates 10 million ATPs per second in just one cell. That ATP can power a biker up the trail, or it can power your brain cells as you learn challenging biology topics. Hi. Hopefully you guys expended a bunch of ATP watching that video. When I export these videos, because this one's not, the file isn't fully embedded into PowerPoint, you'll just hear the voice, but you won't see the video, and that's why I've put the link up there, right? So if you just go to that YouTube link, you can watch the video as many times as you want, okay? Right, so we'll finish off by talking about energy metabolism. So we've been using glucose as the example, right? So glucose, so here's glucose right here, goes through glycolysis, is converted to pyruvate, pyruvate enters the mitochondria, is converted to acetyl-CoA, turns the Krebs cycle, and then this down here is, you can think of as electron transport, okay? So the oxidative phosphorylation, think of as electron transport, okay? So we've been using glucose as the example. Right? Our neurons in our brain will only run on glucose, so it'll only do this series of reactions. Okay, notice that we've got some double-sided arrows. Okay, so that means pyruvate can go backwards through glycolysis and be converted into glucose. And this occurs when we do anaerobic respiration, right? That lactic acid gets converted back to pyruvate. Pyruvate can get converted back to glucose. Right. What we're going to talk about for energy metabolism is the fact that other things like amino acids and triglycerides can be used for energy metabolism. Right? And most of our other cells are perfectly happy to run especially on fatty acids. So what do we primarily store energy as? Do we store mainly glycogen or mainly fat? We store mainly fat. Okay, so that means fat is the most abundant source for energy. Okay, and cells other than our brain are happy to churn along on fatty acids. Okay, so what we're going to look at first is what's called gluconeogenesis. Okay, so our brain needs a constant supply of glucose. So that means we have to have biosynthetic pathways to make glucose because we are hopefully not continuously consuming glucose, right? If you're constantly sucking on soda, then maybe you don't have to do any gluconeogenesis, but that's a really bad habit, okay? So in times of fasting, when our brain needs glucose, okay, we can make glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. So we can make it from glycerol, Okay, so this brown arrow showing glycerol can enter one of the glycolytic pathways and be converted into glucose. Or we can make glucose from amino acids, but just the carbon-containing part. Okay, so that amino group gets clipped off. This is ammonia right here. Ammonia is really toxic. So we convert it to urea, and then we just excrete that urea. Okay, so when our brain needs a constant supply of glucose and we have gone through all our glycogen stores, okay, we will make glucose from glycerol and from amino acids. Okay. Most of our cells happily run on triglycerides. Okay, that glycerol can be entered into glycolysis, right? And then it'll be converted into pyruvate, go through the Krebs cycle, etc. Or fatty acids will be converted into acetyl-CoA or into coenzyme 2H and be burned that way, be converted into ATP. So when I say burned, carbon molecules are clipped apart, breaking those covalent bonds, pick up the electrons by NADH and FADH2, Deliver them to electron transport. Okay, so that's what I mean by being burned. Okay. Most of our cells are happy to just clip apart the carbon molecules in lipids. Okay, we have a purple layer here where if you've got a backup of acetyl CoA, it can be converted into ketones. In starvation state, our brain will run off of ketones. 
Okay, so our allure will make ketones and our brain can run off of those. Although you don't do your best thinking on ketones. Okay. Or diabetics, you might have heard, can go into ketoacidosis. Okay, ketones are acidic. So diabetics, insulin dependent diabetics, right? Their body doesn't produce any insulin. So even though they might have glucose in their bloodstream, they don't know it because there's no insulin. Okay, so they do all this fatty acid mobilization and they get a backup of the cred cycle and so they form ketones instead. Okay, people who are really good at following the Atkins diet, right, that no carb diet, sometimes they go into ketoacidosis as well. And you can smell the ketones on someone's breath. It smells like nail polish remover. Okay. Yeah, it's bad. If someone's in ketoacidosis, it's bad. Not that their breath is bad. I mean, physiologically, it's bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bad breath is the worst concern, the, le no, the least of their concerns. <laughs> right. Proteins, if you eat too much protein, you can convert it into ATP. Okay, we technically do not store protein. Okay, muscle tissue is not a storage organ. If you aren't using that muscle, what happens to it? It atrophies, okay? So if you, eat a, if you drink protein shakes every morning and hope that you'll bulk up, but you don't actually do any exercise, okay? You're just gonna clip off that amino group and you're gonna burn the carbon skeleton, okay? You're gonna clip apart the carbon bonds, release CO2, and have those electrons be picked up by NADH and FADH2. Okay, so you can use lipids for, or lipids, proteins for energy metabolism if you take them in an excess. Okay, in starvation states, you'll start mobilizing amino acids from muscle. Okay, so you'll start breaking down your muscle in order to give other cells an energy source. Okay, any questions about energy metabolism? Take home message being other things can be used besides glucose. And make sure you know what gluconeogenesis means. Okay, so gluconeogenesis is a key term that we talked about. Making glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors, okay, to give the brain a constant supply. And then most cells can use lipids or the carbon skeleton of amino acids for energy production. It's not just glucose.